Words to Live By from Saul Williams. No, I wasn't raised at gunpoint, and I've read too many books to distract me from the mirror when unhappy with my looks. I ain't got proper diction for the makings of a thug. Though I grew up in the ghetto, and my brothers all sold drugs, and though that may validate me for a spot on MTV or give me all the airplay that my bank account would need, I was hoping to invest in a lesson that I learned when I thought this fool would jump me just because it was my turn. I went to an open space because I knew he wouldn't do it if somebody there could see him or somebody else might prove it. And maybe in your eyes, it may seem I got punked out because I walked a narrow path and then went and changed my route. But that openness exposed me to a truth I couldn't find in the clenched fist of my ego or the confines of my mind, in the hipness of my swagger or the swagger in my step or the scowl of my grimace or the meanness of my rep because we represent a truth, son, that changes by the hour. And when you open to it, vulnerability is power. And in that shifting form, you'll find a truth that doesn't change. That truth's living proof of the fact that God is strange. Talk to strangers when family fails and friends lead you astray. And Buddha laughs, and Jesus weeps, and turns out God is gay. As angels and messiahs, love can come in many forms. In the hallways of your projects or the fat girl in your dorm. And when you finally take the time to see what they're about, perhaps you find them lonely or their wisdom trips you out. Maybe you'll find the cycles end you back where you began, but come this time around, you'll have someone to hold your hand, who prays for you, who's there for you, who sends you love and light, exposes you to parts of you that you once tried to fight, and come this time around, you choose to walk a different path. You'll embrace what you turn away and cry at what you laugh, because that's the only way we're going to make it through this storm, where ignorance is common sense and senselessness the norm, and flags wave high above the truth and that you never touch, and stolen goods are overpriced and freedom costs too much, and no one seems to recognize the symbols come to life. The bit an apple on the screen and Jesus had a wife and she was his messiah like that stranger maybe yours who holds a subtle knife that carves the world like magic doors and that's what I've been looking for the bridge from then to now was watching BET like what the fuck son this is foul but that square box don't represent the sphere that we live in where earth is not a flat screen I ain't trying to fit in but this ain't for the underground this here's for the sun a seed a stranger gave to me and planted on my tongue and when I look at you I know I'm not the only one as a gray man once said there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hi, folks. Layman Pascal here. This is another episode of the Integral Stage Author Series. Uh, Bruce Alderman is sitting in with us today because he has a kind of personal relationship with Raleigh, and he's going to do the introduction for us. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, thanks for sharing that, Raleigh. It's great to see you and connect with you in person after all these years. I remember you know, luminous writings from you back in the day when the forums were first opening. And I recall, I think you did a celebration of James Fowler's work and the stages of faith that was really moving and wonderful. So thank you. I've seen your, your integral and your, your Christian and your theological thought flower over the years online. So it's wonderful to see that coming together in a book, you know, dedicated to especially love and the embodiment of love as as the as Christ's way. So that's exciting. I'm I'm really looking forward to diving into the book and to your journey to the book um, with you and, and and with Layman. Thank you. Yeah, let's. Uh, no, it's a pleasure to meet you, Raleigh. Uh, I had a beautiful conversation not too long ago with Paul Smith on Integral Christianity. I find something delightful about this topic. It's a, for me, it's a really great way of touching one of the ancestral roots of the deep history of the West. So I'm excited, looking forward to this conversation. And maybe you could um, tell us, first of all, get this out of the way, where can people buy this book? And then, and what was the genesis of the impulse to make this book? Fantastic, Layman. Thank you very much. Uh, you can buy the book on Amazon, but we're sold out right now. It should should have some more copies in uh, Barnes and Noble, Target. So uh, yeah, it, it's really exciting. And uh, the book is called Integral Christianity, The Way of Embodied Love. And it's meant to be directly in the lineage of integral Christianity, the spirit's call to evolve. And uh, Paul and I are, are good friends and I, I, I love his work. And so my, my attempt was just to make a, an offering right in those footsteps of the integral Christianity that many, uh, many of us are working toward. So <laughs> the Genesis is a great story because I pressed reply to an email from our good friend, Ken Wilbur, 14 years ago. <laughs> and I pressed reply this, this spring with a, with a manuscript to an invitation that he'd given me a long time ago. So the book was about 14 years in the 
in the thinking, but then just 47 days from first word type to, to up on Amazon. And uh, there was some writer's block to it and uh, some shadow to it, to be honest. You know, the, we'll, we'll get into the structure, but chapter seven is, is shadow in us. And it became quite autobiographical, <laughs> uh, unintentionally so. But, uh, you know, there, there was some, uh, the way I describe it, there was a little matryoshka within me who I had to reincorporate. And that was, that was a block that was preventing words that were, were, were brewing or percolating to, to finally land on a page. Who is this book dedicated to? Well, uh, it's dedicated to my father. And uh, we lost him one year ago next week. Um, he, he died after a, a long battle with Parkinson's. Uh, the incredible blessing was that he he wasn't able to to swallow anymore as a course of his Parkinson's, but that meant that we could see him in the hospital. Uh, his his home had been locked down and they'd lost 18 people in the home that he was living in. So we got to see him for one last week and it was absolutely exquisite and just feeling him slowly, slowly slip away. But uh, my holding his one hand, my mom holding his other, you know, listening to a beautiful hallelujah. Uh, on Father's Day last year, we lost him. So, so it's dedicated to my dad. Nice. Um, I'm just going to keep asking questions, but Bruce, you wink at me or something. Where whenever you want to jump in. <laughs> sure. Um, I think before we get into the structure of the book, and I, I think that'll be a big chunk of this conversation, is going through those major intergalactic components and seeing how you relate each of those to the Christ story. Yes. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about your background with this. Like how does, how does a person today get into Christianity? And, you know, I'm assuming it happened in childhood that you became so aligned with this particular tradition. And I'm curious what you saw in it that you liked, you know, for me, there were things, there were certain phrases, certain ideas in there. I thought, Oh, I'd like to know more about that. That resonates. So what did you see in Christianity that you loved when you were young? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we had a family Bible. So before I could even read, I would I would look at the Bible and right on the very inside cover, front cover was, come to me, all who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Yes, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And uh, I couldn't read, so I just looked at the page. And it, was the, it was the page of the Sacred Heart, you know, Christ pointing to his heart. And that always just, it was such a beautiful picture. And the picture really captivated me. And I would ask my mom and dad, what are the words? And they told me that verse. So that was the first verse, but, but it was really the image of, of this beautiful man pointing to his heart and this, the look in his eyes and uh, the absolute love that came through. So that was, that was the first thing. Now, w- what happened, and I write about this in the introduction or what we call the, the departure, but I would have... I was very, very interested in the East and in enlightenment and awakening. And so began to read quite deeply in the East. And then I came to the writings of Father Thomas, Father Thomas Keating. And I saw here is a, here's an embodiment in the West. And by any standard, this is an enlightened man. This is an awakened being. And uh, I love this Buddhist uh, phrase, which is, if something exists, it's possible. And I saw in Father Thomas this, you know, this absolute assurity that this Western path goes all the way to the top, it goes to the summit and, and presumably meets some of the other paths that make it to the summit. So I, I would have seen him just at the coming into pluralistic, and I would have definitely veered away had I not seen this this man in the west with a, an enlightenment east or west so that that was an amazing happening for me that doesn't happen to everybody but then i knew that i could both take a bodhisattva vow but in my case the bodhisattva vow would be remain in the west and and follow this path because there are a billion catholics two billion christians and it might be of some utility to humanity to to walk that path too, and then to report from it the best I could, because there are 2 billion people on the same way. Was your background, family background in Christianity, was it Catholic or what was the tradition? Yeah, we were, we were, we were definitely Catholic. And uh, I, I like to joke that um, 
you know, I, I'd come come home after reading amazing writings from from the East, and I'd be telling my folks, you know, well, the, the Buddhists go to heaven too, and and they were they weren't entirely sure. But uh, then after landing at Integral and working with Buddhists for a few years, I started <laughs> I started reconsidering that, that that they get to heaven too. So yeah, yeah, I asked because you know I also had Catholic and Episcopal. Mm-hmm roots. And I think if I had met someone like Thomas Keating at the right time, I might have stayed within, you know, the Catholic tradition and and, and pursued that path. For me, an inspiration was Thomas Merton. And, you know, he was a, a luminous figure. And he also pointed to the East, but also remained very true to the deep mystical roots within Catholicism. But as a young man, when I looked out to find this as a path of practice, it wasn't there. Even in the Catholic churches, they, they had mostly no idea what I was talking about when I would come to them with any references from mystical Christianity or Merton or Meister Eckhart or anything like that. Either they looked at it warily or they didn't have even any clue about it. So I think what you're doing and what uh, Paul Smith and others are doing is important in terms of laying out some work that people can look to as a, you know, a viable contemplative living path that they can get on board with um, and not necessarily have to look somewhere else for, for a, a vital living contemplative tradition. So what do you think could be done more and better? to help, you know, coming generations for this? Yeah, yeah, great question. Thank you, Bruce. And the continuation of having met Father Thomas at the cusp of pluralistic was to meet Ken at the cusp of integral. And that, that again, was a beautiful repeating of a knowledge that it's all here. It's all right here. And what, you know, integral opens so many things up, but what I was able to do was to, to, put these lanterns in the ground from the east that that beautifully lit up a western way and so uh and and you both talked amazingly at the very beginning of the you know the future faces of spirit series you both talked amazingly about how these traditions might start to interweave and cast light on one another there's a real co-presencing between the traditions and certainly between a you know a mystical christianity and the vaita vedanta and uh you know, Tibetan Buddhism, they're, they're just amazing Eastern lanterns that light up the West. So uh, Paul's talked about it really, really well, but the idea of a conveyor belt and that, you know, it's not that we need to get everybody reading Merton necessarily, but it is that there's a very, very healthy Amber Christianity and we can speak to that Amber Christianity beautifully, you know, and then there's a very, very healthy orange expression of Christianity and a very, very healthy green. And then there's just a spectacular integral Christianity. And that's been my, my definite experience uh, coming into integral is uh, there, there are some practices that are absolutely seamless that fit absolutely spectacularly within Christianity. In fact, there are hallmarks of that through Christian history. It's just that they're, you know, they're hidden, they're in dusty books on the shelf. So somebody like father Thomas, took that book off the shelf, blew the dust off and attempted to reinterpret something like Lexio Divina, the classic contemplative Christian path into centering prayer, just a spectacularly simple instruction for contemplation. So I would say integral thought is the real key and formulating a healthy Christianity at each of these stages, meeting people exactly where they're at and letting them know they can remain in the tradition and it's all there. And of course, you know, there's a beautiful exploration to be had in the East and uh, they fit together beautifully in, in the many ways that, that you've described, Bruce, that these, these traditions interweave and cast light upon one another. You said um, you realized it's all here. And for me, that's a really intriguing aspect of all this, that the, the making explicit of a truth that was already implicit that you hadn't noticed before. And in Ken's introduction to this volume, he really dwells on the concept of subsisting truths that are already there, but they don't exist until we meet them and you know bring them forth into our experience of the world. And it seems like 
that plays a huge role in Christianity, both in terms of, oh, it's already part of our cultural tradition, but we don't necessarily recognize that, but also in terms of the, you know, the tale of the Christ, which is the tale of divinity showing up as a human and that not being recognized, right? Or some people recognize it somewhere down the line, but there's this recurrent pattern of a truth is already present, but hasn't been acknowledged and invoked. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I, I love what Ken wrote. And <laughs> uh, he, he was very kind to, to write it. And it's a really powerful thought that let's, let's take the integral model and look at the life of Jesus in Nazareth. And that really hasn't been done that much because, you know, structuralism is, is relatively late on the scene. And then the, the various nuances of that up to Ken and taking something like altitude and saying, okay, what does Jesus of Nazareth look like if we look in terms of, of structures of stages? And so what I tried to do and, and Ken beautifully back that up in the forward was to say, they didn't have those stages at the time. They hadn't been explicated, but what if we put those lenses on now and looked at this historical person through those lenses? Could that, provide anything. And some people might say that, well, that, you know, those never existed. So what does it matter? But in, in fact, it really does matter. And something that, that Ken has done in his, his writing throughout is to say, take your beliefs and just bracket them for a second. So just for a second, we'll put aside that he's the second person of the Trinity and, you know, uh, the Christologies that, that came through the medieval church, et cetera. Let's just put those aside Let's take these amazing lenses. We're 20 centuries away from Jesus of Nazareth, but is there something in our day and age that we can use to spot something in him back then that could be enlightening for us? And I found, again, there was dramatically so that we can look through integral lenses at the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And those stages did not exist because nobody knew about them in the day. Jesus wasn't saying, I got to get to green, you know, but he was trying to take the widest aperture on his historical situation and his place in it. And so those stages didn't exist, but they subsisted and they exist now. We can look through those lenses and get some insight on his life. And that might provide some insight on our own lives. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all there. It's always been there. And Ken and others have given us a lens to look at the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And it, it gives a, an immense view that I don't think has really been taken yet. And that's what captivated me for the book. There's a very interesting philosophical move that runs through this book where you, you say phrases like uh, the deepest possible view from the highest possible vantage point. And it gives you the ability to say that the maximum convergence of state capacity and the developmental leading edge is somehow analogous to every other instance of the maximum convergence of those things. So that Jesus, in a sense, is embodying today's leading edge because he was embodying that convergence at that leading edge. And all those leading edges are, you know, holographically self-similar in some sense. Amen, amen, amen. That, that, that's absolutely it. That's absolutely the point. And, uh, you know, Ken talks about this. That, that's Ken's supermind. So the highest stage achieved to date and the highest state, and you put those together, that is non-dual supermind and the states and stages merge at that point. And what Ken says is that that's a moment in which spirit flows into evolution perfectly. You know, it's got nothing to step down to. So it, it flows into evolution as a novel emergent, but the, the probability and the possibility are certainty in that case. And so that's happened just a handful of times in, in history that we know, but we know about them, you know, and that's Gautama Buddha and that's Jesus of Nazareth. And, and so spirit is pouring into evolution, as Ken would say, unadulterated at that point. And, and, and it can change the course of world history. And so I definitely identify that that happened in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And it's very liberating to me to say that's not the only time it ever happened in history. What has your relationship to Jesus been over the years? Can you talk a little bit about how maybe that has unfolded? and? Just as a background for that, I wanted to say, you know, of course, I was deeply 
devoted at one point in my life and later moved on in other directions. And I can recall when I was most deeply into Dzogchen practice, I was kind of haunted by Jesus in that doing some of the Yidam visualizations, uh, sometimes Jesus's image would come up for me and actually be more full, more luminous, more whole body effective <laughs> um, than some of the images that I was working with from within that tradition. So there was still a pull there that, that affected me. And I, I'm just interested because I know you've moved in and out of um, some Eastern practices as well. What, what your relationship has been with Jesus over these um, years? Yeah, beautiful, Bruce. Uh, and there's a, there's a story of a, a Christian priest who had actually left Christianity, converted to Buddhism, and then ended up being invited to an interfaith gathering that happened to be at the church that he used to serve in. And so you have this Zen monk, this realized Zen monk who's sitting in this church, and he realized, again, the truth of the body and blood of Christ sitting in that church. So it was a truth that he'd come to and then moved on from in some sense, but then came into more deeply uh, later and at a surprising time, you know, just kind of time and space converging in his case. So I, I think that's, that, that's very true. And the seeds of any religion are planted in us really deeply. And that's one reason, you know, for my Bodhisattva vow to remain in the West is that those seeds are very deeply planted in some billions of people. And that's the plant that wants to come forth. Uh, and, it, and it can, there's nothing holding it back. Certainly not the dogmatic truths that, that, that seem to be holding it back through the years. So yeah, I've definitely deepened in relationship with, with Jesus, you know, the, the conversational friend through, through teenage years, definitely the footprints in the sand analogy of it, you know, I was being carried through sometimes in, in, in life and could feel that divine touch in my case. And what I would say is that, you know, he, he didn't say admire me on a wall and, and we really do that. We admire him on a wall and we end up projecting so much goodness onto him, but he said, follow me. And again, it, it can fall on deaf ears, but follow me means do what I've done in your case doesn't mean admire me. It means do what I've done in your case. So in more recent years, and really since integral, it was, okay, let me look carefully at what he did. And let me try to understand what would that mean to do that in my case. And I started getting some, some really deep insight that it's, it's not, it's, it's, it was no longer pray to him so much as see the injunction he was making and take it up in my case. And, and, you know, that's kind of the beauty of many of the Eastern paths and particularly Buddhism, you know, there are injunctions. This is repeatable. If you do this, 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 this will come about. Now that doesn't, doesn't replace grace at all. And Lehman, you talk about grace just fantastically again in the, in the future phases of spirit episode that, that you did. So that there's both the grace, but there's also these steps. So it steps up the mountain. And what I've always thought is, the sun is coming up for the first time on the mountain and you can start to see that these amazing paths and you can see their convergence toward the top. So we've been stumbling around in darkness, you know, and now uh, there are some lanterns along the way. And as I, as I go on my way, I notice that the lanterns, a lot of them are not from the West, they're from the East, but they're lighting up that, that Western path. So I would say the big evolution for me more recently was to really take him seriously in follow me and to really think through with, as you're saying, Pascal the, or Lehman, the, with the breadth, you know, the, the view and the vantage point to really see what does that mean in my case? And then to, to really get serious about doing that in my case. There's a long, almost underground history of Christians trying to bring the injunction aspect forward, right? Uh, Meister Eckhart, Kierkegaard was very focused on that difference, right? But right back to, you know, Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises. Mm -hmm. So I'm fascinated about the way that this stands in that tradition. But I'd like to kind of pivot toward talking about the structure of the book. 
uh, because you go through different major aspects of the integral model and you wrestle with what that means in terms of Christ. And so maybe we could start with um, stages. I've always found a, a very strong, quote unquote, modernist streak in Christianity, right? Right from Paul's communities that are going to be international, not just Roman or Greek or Jewish, to the notion of a personal Christ and the parable of the Samaritan in which your ethnic folk and your co-religionists don't necessarily help you, but that help might come from your ethnic rivals. So you've got to have this bigger uh, embrace of human beings beyond kingdoms, beyond nations, beyond races. So uh, for you, uh, what are you looking at and what are you working with when you ask yourself a question like, what stage is Jesus at? Yeah, yeah, great question. So just a, a brief word on the structure of the book, and it, it, was, it was very, very simple to, you know, when, once the structure came up. And uh, I've got a diagram near the beginning, which is in the tradition of the I am the vine icons, these amazing icons where Christ is in the center and many, many branches. And the branches are different teachers, different schools, uh, different apostles who who came from the I am the vine. And so uh, the table of contents just unfolded that way. And that is, let's look at the integral injunction, which is wake up, grow up, clean up, show up. Let's see how Jesus of Nazareth navigated that particular injunction, even in retrospect, that didn't exist in his day, but it subsisted. And in the end, he walked that injunction perfectly. And so then what would the wake up, grow up, clean up, show up look like in my case, or in the case of, of Christianity? So the grow up in, in Jesus is, is really important. And again, I, I don't know that we've looked at it. And so my analysis is that humanity at that point was up to the mythic level. And in the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth, there was the mythic Judaism and the mythic Roman, and they were butting heads, and that the capital of Jerusalem was a powder keg. And that's, the, that's what he walked into uh, when he was born and throughout his lifetime. So what, what I see is that Jesus stabilized that state of mythic perfectly and really, really well. And there's lots of evidence to that. And we can go into that. So having stabilized it, he busted through. And, you know, in, in Ken's analogy, uh, and I, I really love this spirit is bungee jumper and it, it, it never, it never made print. So I think it now has, and it's just an amazing analogy. So spirit leaps off this bridge with a bungee cord into this vast valley. And that's the involutionary arc. And then at the bottom of the jump, spirit rebounds back towards spirit. Now there's a canvas that's hanging from the bridge, all the height and depth down to the bottom of the valley. So at the bottom of the jump, somebody wakes up as a human being and they see the canvas and that's reality. And, and it looks beautiful and realistic, but they basically take it as given. So life is given. But if the rebound comes high enough, the images on that canvas start being less and less sure and starts to get a bit transparent. And then the jumper on the return can actually see the valley behind and they have a paintbrush and they can start to paint what the contents of what they're actually seeing in behind the canvas. So that uh, my contention is very strongly happened in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. He got to the top of the mythic and then the images end. And now he sees the actual valley and he starts painting them exactly as he sees it. And also as he wants to infuse it very intentionally so on his evolutionary return so i just see that he busted through the mythic and there was really not much there because few if any individuals had ever been up in that particular stage space so you know he began to paint what what the early rational would look like for instance or the early pluralistic would look like or the early integral would look like so as i look at him in stages i see he hit the top of the stage of his day and then it's blue skies. And he began to, you know, trod on that, on the sands that, that had not really been trod on before and to blaze a, a brand new trail. And the, my contention in the book is that he began to paint some of the features. And, and Ken talks about that in Religion of Tomorrow, that in the third tier stages now, 
you're actually defining what the future looks like. You're not, you're not finding what the future looks like. You're in St. Exupery's as for you and the future, your task is not to foresee it, but to enable it. And so I personally believe that a lot of the love that we start to see in the second tier stages, and certainly in the third tier stages, that love was put there by this man, Jesus of Nazareth, who just hit the top of the painting and, and kept going and going. Well, that's beautiful. I love the idea that somebody has the uh, the option to make a difference in that space, right? That somebody favored the love version of it, and now that's yes. there. <laughs> Ab absolutely. That, that, that's my, my deep contention. Now, I'll say one more thing about stages, and this is from N.T. Wright, who's a great uh, contemporary theologian and Bible scholar. And he, he makes the point really well, what, what would have been in the mind of this Semitic man at the dawn of the common era? And it wasn't that, oh, I'm the second person of the Trinity, like I'm, I'm, I'm the word made flesh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that wouldn't have been in his mind. That was a Greek system that was retrofitted onto the life of Jesus of Nazareth in the century or so following his death and then propagated through Roman structures, et cetera. Now, I'm really grateful for all that because we know about the guy, you know, but that would not have been on his mind. So N.T. Wright contended that what would, what would have been on Jesus' mind is the Torah, the temple, and the fulfillment of the promise of God. Those three things, any Semitic man at the dawn of the common era, if he was studious, etc., or she, would have been on to those particular three themes. So he would have known and loved the temple, but he would have had an enormous disappointment in the temple because the temple was built for a purpose, but it wasn't really fulfilling that purpose. You know, and we see that in the turning of the tables and the money changers in the courts, etc. So it's both a love for what the temple was supposed to be, but a grave disappointment that it was no longer fulfilling what it was built for. And the Jews of the time were said to be in the second temple phase, which is that, okay, you know, we've built the temple, but we're under subjugation from the Romans. And this is a powder keg. And it's really not what we thought, what, what we had wanted, what we'd set out to do when we began building this temple. So that's the temple and the Torah too. He would have known Jewish scriptures inside out, back of his hand. Uh, he quoted them all the time, traded quotes with the devil, traded quotes with the Pharisees. You know, he, so he was, he was apparently, you know, really well schooled in the scriptures. So Torah and temple, two things that were very, very present for him. And then the big third one is the promise. And the promise was that, again, in this simple second temple phase, the, the Jewish people felt abandoned. They felt we, we accepted the promise of God. We came into the land, uh, but now we're being occupied again as we have been in our history. Something's got to happen. God has got to return. God has withdrawn. It's not that God is dead, but God has withdrawn. God is no longer actively involved in our day-to-day -day lives. So the promise was that God would return to the way that, that God had been present in the early days, in, in the days of Moses and uh, liberation from Egypt, and that God's right hand would come as the Messiah. So Jesus would have been really aware of the promise of God and the return of God, the imminent return of God. So that's kind of what I've said as the mindset of Jesus at the time that he was driven into the desert. He would have treasured the temple, he would have known very, very well the scriptures, and he would have been aware and praying for the return of God in a new way. And that's kind of uh, where his stages got to him, got him to, which was the leading edge at the day and, and even beyond. And then we can start to look at, well, what happens on the state side that animates uh, where he's at on the stage side? I wanted to... Uh just make one observation and ask a mm -hmm. question related to stages mm -hmm. before we move on to um, any other elements. And the other day I was talking to Corey actually about this. Mm -hmm. um, Layman and I sometimes will talk about what the religious landscape looks like if you take an aqua lens, um, especially Layman emphasizes how the, the boundaries between different traditions become blurry or even 
totally reconfigured. Um, taking an aqua lens, you can see a different landscape emerge. And so Corey and I were talking also about the conveyor belt and through stages. And often there's a movement. Uh, many people, and you described that for the priest just a little bit ago, where he or, or the you know the, the Christian minister who had left and became a Zen teacher and then came back. And for many people, there is that journey of starting out within a tradition, often Christianity or Judaism, moving outside to some other tradition, and then maybe a homecoming um, at a different level from a different place. So the thought here was maybe in our time, given the uneven lines and emphases across traditions, that conveyor belt unfolding may not necessarily happen within the same tradition. Um, it may not follow the boundaries of, of professed belief, but a more organic. So what do you feel about that? And how's that shown up for, for you and in, in your understanding of, of you know, basically the, the Christian journey? Yeah, uh, well, well, great question. And I, I'm reminded of a line from Religion of Tomorrow with, in which Ken says, uh, you know, because again, non-duality and the fact that on the relative side of the street, uh, things are unfolding in evolution. And if, if non-duality is the combination of both of those, then not, not even spirit knows where this is going, which is really, really captivating to me. So, yeah, you know, I think in the end, it, it's sort of like a, like a stream and it kind of gets caught in this cul-de-sac, but the water keeps coming in. So at some point it's going to jump its banks. It's going to be in an unpredictable way. And I, I, I would say that that's happened in Christianity and that, in some sense, it, it has to jump its banks to, to be able to continue down toward the ocean. And, you know, I, I see it, for instance, in a, in a statement from the, the recent catechism of the Catholic Church, in which it was maintained that no new revelation is expected until the end of time. But, but that was always a really interesting statement to me, because, you know, if spirit doesn't know where this is going, then, then, then the church doesn't know where this is going either. You know, and if you say no new revelation is expected until the end of time, then either you're wrong or if the revelation is in Christ, then we haven't really understood Christ yet. And we need to deepen it in the understanding of Christ. And that will be the river jumping its banks, etc. cetera. Um, I love how you've presenced Raimon Panikar in, in some of the exemplars, Bruce, that, that you foresaw in, in the series of the, the future faces of spirit. And he was fantastic that way. You know, he's like, just as Jesus sort of jumped the banks of Judaism, Christ is jumping the banks of Christianity. And if both of you are deep practitioners in the East, then there are aspects of your practice that I will definitely see as Christ moving in your lives. And you might too. And, you know, if, if it would be helpful, then, then that's something that you could easily adopt. Uh, or that's a lantern on your Eastern journey from the West. So, yeah, I, I think that really this in the 60s and Vatican II and the, the you know, salvation was admitted to the Buddhists after 20 centuries. Uh, I think it's a really good move. And, and now Christianity is being informed uh, from these other paths. Those are lanterns on our journey and they're, they're entirely legitimate. Even in the straight line practice of Christianity, the practice of I amness is is radically radically relevant. So what Ramana Maharshi taught is radically relevant to even an Orthodox Christian. The same way, you know, the 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 apocryphal Gospel of Thomas. Well, Elaine Pagels, awesome Bible scholar, says Thomas is a response to, or John is a response to Thomas. The Gospel of John seems to have been a response to the Gospel of Thomas. So the school of John, school of Thomas, you know, they're rivalrous in the beginning. And John has Thomas as the doubter. Thomas has himself as, you know, be, had the ear of Christ and, and that the Christ spoke a secret to Thomas himself. So if the gospel of John, which is really the height of our theology in Christianity, if that's a response to the gospel of Thomas, then even if I'm a mainline Orthodox 
Christian in, in, in the sense of theology, I need to know the Gospel of Tom inside, Thomas inside out because that informs the canonical Gospel of John that I'm so dependent on. This uh, idea of there being no new revelation until the end of time has a uh, a mystical back door whereby any moment could be the end of time in the twinkling mm-hmm. of an eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, that's an invitation for us to talk about states. Yeah. And uh, you know, when somebody makes confessions of unity, especially when they're separated from us by centuries or millennia, it can be very tricky to determine whether they're speaking from an an exquisitely refined complexity of perception and cognition or whether they're just specializing in that state where everything seems like a beautiful blending and harmonizing and paradox. So how do you go about, you know, teasing out what is a confession of state experience and what is a stage experience and, and what's your take on Christ through the States in general? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Layman. So, you know, if we take um, Evelyn Underhill's, conception of state development and you, you know uh, uh, so her her 1911 book on mysticism and trace those in the life of of jesus now that you know that's different than looking at him through, through stages and as we know states are very very old and model after waking dreaming deep sleep and possibly some container of those those three states following them so you know we, we see jesus uh, i mean the the, the the traditional picture has been that Jesus is on Mary's knee and he's already enlightened and omniscient and omnipresent and et cetera. And it probably, you know, it, it ain't necessarily so, you know, he, he would have grown up and learned under Joseph's tutelage and Mary's tutelage and the village, et cetera. And you know, the, there's speculation that he got to the East and Paramahansa Yogananda feels like he did and, and who knows, but my conception of Jesus doesn't depend on that. And in any case, he was kind of on the end point of the Silk Road. So he would have been, you know, in town, hearing different people, exchanging different ideas that weren't necessarily simply Judaism. But at any rate, he he's found in the temple at 12 saying, did you not know that I would be in my father's house? So it's the temple's already becoming important to him at that point in terms of states. And then the baptism of John and the spirit is seen to descend on him not only by Jesus, but by John the Baptist and uh, a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So the spirit drove him to be baptized by John. The spirit drove him after that baptism into the desert. And now he's in the desert for 40 days, 40 nights. We don't know. We know that he ate locusts and wild honey. We don't know about the practice in the desert. We do know about the the temptations at the end of those 40 days from the devil. But at any rate, you know, I see that I see that he's been awakened and goes into the desert. And it's both a time of shadow, a time of shadow practice, but also a time of illumination. So, you know, under Hill's third stage and with purgation being the second stage. So in the desert, I, I believe he, practiced I am this, I am this, I am this, I am this. And the reason I say that is that he's already got a, a very, very close relationship with the father. Did you not know that I needed to be in my father's house? But soon after coming out of the desert, being driven by the spirit now to, to share the, the good news, soon after that, he says, before Abraham was, I am. So he's stabilized. And, and soon after that, I and the father are one. So he's both uh, entered into a deep relationship with the father as Abba, as daddy. He was the first person to, to make that claim that, that to, to refer to God as daddy, you know, rather than as the, the, the transcendent father, the unknowable one. So the, the transcendent becomes imminent in that second person. But he's also come out of the desert with the first person before Abraham was, I am. So. And he starts to make amazing third person statements too, like consider the lilies. So it, it seems to me he really had a three, three phase practice in the desert. And particularly uh, 
stabilized a very high second person, I and the father are one, you know, then, then goes to a first person, I am who I am. And this, this meeting, he's now at Supermind in Ken's model because he's stabilized the highest stage to date, which is a mythic and beyond. And he's, he's stabilized, as far as I can see, uh, you know, very, very high state, causal non-dual. You know, he's, he's up in Turia and possibly Turia Tita. I and mean, these are all things that we can, we can debate on. But at any rate, what happens is the Torah, the temple, and the promise of God, which is what he was aware of in terms of his stages, those are absolutely animated and set on fire by his high state. I and the Father are one, and before Abraham was, I am. So it becomes not only a love for the temple, but this temple isn't cutting it. I have to be the temple. So it, it's a radical, you know, nobody else is going to do it. So I have to take the, the purpose of the temple, which is the forgiveness of sins, you know, etc. And the Torah, not just I need to follow it, I need to fulfill it. And so from this high state, he's, he begins to live in real time fulfillment of the scriptures, which is, which is absolutely wild. Like he, his first sermon in Nazareth. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to set free the captives, to give sight to the blind, to feed the hungry, to liberate the oppressed. He closes the scroll. I tell you truly, these words are fulfilled in their hearing. So he is in real time reading the scriptures and fulfilling it. And we see on the cross, which we, which we can get into, an amazing real-time fulfillment of scriptures. So temple is not just a place that I have to support, but something I need to be, I need to internalize that and bring that to the people. And Torah is not just something to learn and to quote, but to fulfill in real time as, uh, as my footsteps land on the ground. And then the promise of God, which is the big one, you know, not just that God's right hand will arrive and because nobody else is going to do it, it'll have to be me, not just that, but God is returning to Israel. And how else is God going to return to Israel if not through me? So it's it's an absolutely audacious take, but he's 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 reached the height of states of stages. And coming out of the desert, he's he's reached a, an extremely high state. And he's got no choice. It's choiceless, but he's got to animate those three promises. The temple, I will become that. The Torah, I will fulfill that. And the promise of God that has to come through me, not just as the Messiah, but as God is with us, Emmanuel. One of the, um, I think, trickiest things for people in the integral space is to tease apart what they mean by so-called gross consciousness from what they mean by the upper right quadrant, by objectivity. So that, that confusion in my mind is a bit of a segue from states to quadrants. And so I'm curious how you see the tetra rising of Jesus. How is he showing up subjectively, objectively, in shared ways and in sort of systemic relational ways? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Layman. So you know, so far we we we've traced his waking up and his growing up. He he woke up in the desert, you know, and following that, uh, there's this amazing harmony and and unfolding in his life which is a quiet time of prayer and in the temple drawing the line in the sand let the one who's not sinned cast the first stone and the very same day before abraham was i am so this amazing rhythm of a quiet time on the mount of olives and in the temple you know and, and line in the sand so this this beautiful rhythm that that we see in him uh, but he's no longer seeking he found what he was looking for in the desert. Now he's fulfilling it. So there's his waking up and his growing up and, you know, his cleaning up clearly in the desert, you know, the, these three temptations with the devil, that's, that's him staring down shadow and, and reincorporating it. So he's whole now. And now he's actually reaching out to the shadow in others, you know, to the man born blind or uh, the person with leprosy or you know, the, the various possessions, et cetera. 
So, so showing up is what, what this guy really, really did well, you know, and showing up in four quadrants. So what I see is that this incredible realization, his upper left realization, that's his states and stages, the, you know, the, the stages subsisted, they didn't exist, but they subsisted. And we can look from that, you know, third person on a first person now. So stabilized a high stage stabilized a very high state that's his upper left and he knows i've got to be the temple i've got to be the torah i've got to be the fulfillment of the promises so what happens is that amazing upper left shows up in his upper right which is action which is you know three years you know, like i just blink uh from three years ago well that was the length of his ministry and this guy changed history in in, in the time of three years so so his action just follows spectacularly his his upper left state. And in fact, the, the way I, I phrase it is, um, you know, the, the evangelist John in Revelation says, behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the old heaven and the old earth had passed away. So what I see is that in his upper left, he stabilized the kingdom of heaven. He taught about it a hundred times. We can say... You know, he might not have said this about the Romans or whatever, but he did talk about the kingdom of heaven or, or the kingdom of God a hundred times. So he stabilized that kingdom of heaven. Now, the new earth, the upper right, is the perfect reflection of the kingdom of heaven. So his inside kingdom of heaven is reflected perfectly in his outside, the new earth. And where they're not perfectly reflected, He's going to use love to bridge the gap and to enter the breach. So he begins to fulfill thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you could say that this person's life was all about on earth as it is in heaven. So he begins to fashion the new earth from this perfect kingdom of heaven that he's realized within. Wherever there's a gap. He's going to bridge it in love. So line in the sand because there's a gap because they want to stone this woman who was caught in adultery, you know, and, and he makes those interventions all the time. So he's starting to form an upper right in his behavior, but also just his, his making things land, his fashioning on earth. He's, he's fashioning an upper right that matches that kingdom of heaven upper left. Similarly, his lower left, he begins to form a community. Uh, he chooses apostles. Now, um, Mary Magdalene was the apostle to the apostles. She brought the good news to the apostles. She's not an apostle, mind you, because she's a woman, but she's the apostle to the apostles. But he's convening this, this lower left community that's a beautiful reflection of his upper left kingdom of heaven. And um, that community is the apostles, but wider than that, the disciples. And then it, it still grows to today. So that amazing emanation in the upper left is now being reflected in the lower left community gathered around Christ and his upper left actions and not just actions, but actually forming this new earth with his, with his very hands, you know, he kneels down on the ground, makes a paste of mud to paste on the eyes of the man born blind. You know, he's, he's, he's forming from the earth, this, this new earth. Um, and Layman, you, you, you again talk about it in that, that amazing first talk on, the, the future faces of spirit. You know, we have to do it with the elements that we have right now. It's not the Aramaic, it's not the Sanskrit, it's the world right now. So this guy's bending down and using dust to heal the man born blind. It's amazing. So that's the upper left and, and or upper right and lower left. And it starts to make its way to the lower right. So in his very lifetime, you know, when he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. That was actually for a judicial process. So he's, he's not just saying, get together and think about me and I'm there. Now that's beautiful. But he's also saying, here's how you solve problems. You get the community together and you deliberate on it in this way. So he's got various lower right statements. Now, obviously, there's a lower right that grew in his wake, which turned into the church and, you know, the word of God going to all, all the lands. And I, I think we made some just horrific missteps in that building out the lower right. Uh, it has to be said that it, there was a beautiful stability in the medieval times that that 
came in the wake of Jesus, you know, so the Western civilization in good ways and bad is based on uh, that early church. And, uh, you know, so it definitely has a, has a landing in, in the lower right as well. So th there's no doubt that something happened in the life of an obscure man at the dawn of the common era in Palestine that really propagated to the quadrants in, in powerful ways. And now, you know, there may be some corrections that need to be made, but they can be made in the spirit of that kingdom of heaven that this guy realized and just said, do the same that I've done, do it in your case and do greater things than these, which was such a captivating thought. But that that's the call to us now is to do the greater things that he, he spoke of. Beautifully put. And that's a, a great segue to what I wanted to ask you. Thinking about the tetra manifestation <laughs> of Christ, as you've just beautifully described it, and the Future Faces of Spirit series that we've referenced a couple times, which... I think you should be part of, but uh, thinking about the future faces of spirit and the, you know, what do you see, um, especially looking back at the, you know, exemplar of, of Christ in his time, and what do you see as emerging now for the future faces of spirit, especially, you know, um, what's next for, for Christian flowering? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. So the the structure of the book is very simply that there are eight chapters and the first four are wake up, grow up, clean up, show up in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. That's Christ in history. The last four chapters are wake up, grow up, clean up, show up in Christ in mystery. And Christ in mystery is necessarily us, necessarily. There, there, there's no way around it. And uh, St. Paul certainly speaks about Christ in mystery is, is Christ in you. Jesus, time and time again, I mean, this is, this is amazing. And it, it comes back to co-presencing and polyphilia that, that you had mentioned, Bruce. And that is that what Jesus starts to do is to say, whatsoever you do to the least of my sisters and brothers, that you do to me. Well, that's amazing. And he also says, love your neighbor as yourself not love your neighbor as much as yourself. He didn't say that. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. So he's starting to have this amazing intuition of self as beyond the body mind of Jesus of Nazareth. So much so that my neighbor is everybody. As you said, Layman, my neighbor is the Samaritan. You know, my, my neighbor is the other. And whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, including the lilies of the field, you know, it, sentient beings go all the way down for him. He's not just talking about humanity. He's, he's talking about everything. So he sees his self in other and he sees other in himself. He's an amazing walking example of polyphilia, of loving the many and of co-presencing. Amazing. So, so his self has expanded. And in fact, the, the Eucharist, which is just a, a stunning miracle to me, this is my body. The earth is my body. Like the, this wine from these grapes is my body. This bread from this wheat is my body. Everything on the table, everything on that, that last supper table, that's my body. And I'm giving it to you. Not just his body and blood, but I mean, to me, he's transubstantiating space and time. You know, that, that ritual that's happening at that table, he's opening to all, all of history, to he's opening to eternity, and we, and we still participate in it. So we still participate in the kingdom of heaven is within, and this new earth is without, and we need to fashion it with the inexhaustible love that was made for this realm. So in this beautiful recognition of self, he asks us to do the same. So we wake up, grow up, clean up, show up. But it's different now. Our, 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 our waking up is, is virtually the same. So for instance, we can practice Ramana Maharshi's self-inquiry. I am not this, I am not that, I'm not this, I am not that. All that remains is I am. I am who am. So, so our waking up can be similar and there's amazing practices east and west and in the three faces to, to wake up. The growing up is very, very different than Jesus' day. You know, it's not 
what would Jesus do? It's what will Christ do? And just like Jesus said, I have to be the temple. I have to fulfill the Torah. I have to be the promise. We have to do the same. So we have to figure out what is the temple and the Torah and the promise in our case. And that looks very, very different. We don't, we don't need to go walking on the dusty roads necessarily. You know, we, we need to do, and again, Layman, we need to, we need to do the injunction that, that you gave us and, and you too, Bruce, and the, the, those first two amazing uh, series. You know, and so, so Layman, I've got this paper from you, circa 2010, Five Pillars of Planetary Wisdom Civilization. It's fantastic. I need to know if, if you've updated this circa 2010 document because things are getting worse, uh, but it's fantastic. This is what we've got to do in our day and age, you know? And, and so we have, to, we have to take this lower right artifact of the World Wide Web. And together with AI, what I see it doing is it's warping things because it's growing so quickly. That lower right is growing so quickly. It's stretching the fabric that needs to tetra mesh in the culture and in the individual behavior. So it's growing so quickly that paradoxically, the culture is being lowered and individual behavior is being lowered and our upper left wellness is being shattered because that, that, that lower right is scaling too quickly and with no sense of ethic, except the nine companies that control global AI. And then three of them are Chinese state surveillance companies and six of them are, are profit US companies. You know, So we need to do something, we need to do something, you know, I ask at the end of the book, what is the baptism of spirit and of fire? Well, we're being baptized by fire, you know, quite literally right now. Jesus said, I'm thirsty on the cross. Jesus says, Christ says, I can't breathe, man, on a street in Minneapolis. You know, we are being baptized by fire right now. So part of our growing up is seeing, like prophets do, seeing the times really, really clearly. And I see both of you have done that uh, in, in the fantastic integral stage offering that, that you're giving. You're seeing the times clearly. And you're saying, here's some of the things we really need to be doing and, and giving out injunctions. So that's our, our growing up, our cleaning up, obviously. You know, And again, my, my chapter seven is autobiographical, but I realized I've got no more pesos. We start with 100 pesos. I've got no more pesos to invest on my states or stages because they're tied up in shadow you know, at, at my trauma from five years old. So the only way to grow further on those states and stages is to reincorporate that little matryoshka who was left behind at five years old. So we've got to clean up, but then we've got to show up and show up in four quadrants and show up in the ways that the two of you are inviting to the people in this series. And I just love how you're, you're taking, you know, the words of Wilbur but Jorge Ferrer, you know, and, and all these people. And you're saying, okay, we've got to take this and we've got to run with it. And here's the multiple ways we can do that. You know, here's how we can show up. But our, our showing up looks a lot different than Jesus. But the similarity is that we take our, our, our woken up state and our, our grown up stage and now we say, I have to act because nobody else is going to do it. It's got to be, it's got, it's got to be us. And, and if not now, when? So we have to repeat that injunction in our case. It looks very different, but we've got to be fearless about it. And uh, that's the only way we're going to make it through this storm. Um, there actually is a, an updated version of that document. Okay. But- yeah. <laughs> Uh, but let's dig a little bit more into the into the concepts of shadow and hell, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. there's classically a tension between Jesus and Christianity in this yeah. sense. Uh, Wilhelm Reich wrote a great book called The Murder of Christ, where he imagines Jesus as the most emotionally healthy human being, the, the unarmored body who allows all the stimulations to flow through maximally, the most vulnerable person. On the other hand... For the last couple of hundred years, especially, people have been looking at Christianity going, 
this is a life negative, sex negative, anti-woman, anti-mortality, anti-ecology way of ignoring human complexity and richness that it's got. It's leaving out a whole bunch of the things that make us healthy and make life worth living. And that leads to institutionalized oppression and abuse and all kinds of terrible outcomes we've seen. So how do you how do you hold that problem of health and the problem of what's accepted or not accepted as human nature within Christianity? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, spectacular. Um, <clears throat> there's always the good news and the bad news. And the bad news is if we look in terms of state stages and shadow, Christianity has unfortunately at times frozen at a stage, you know? So, so if, if you misunderstand the no new revelation is expected until the end of time and you don't allow for evolution, then you will freeze and ossify what was said literally in the Bible and try to build a civilization on it. So for instance, and, and you pointed out layman and like, I, I'm always amazed we, we take, as literal truth that the world is 6,000 years old. And we don't take as literal truth, the kingdom of heaven and God that was preached 100 times. So we take this, this obscure numerology reading of, of the allegory of Genesis and make that human history. And we don't take Jesus up on, ask me anything and I will do it in God's name. He says that five times in the Last Supper discourse. I didn't realize that until I reread it before writing the book. He said it five times in his goodbye message. So he must mean it. You know, so we, we in terms of stages, we, stayed, we, we freeze things at a mythic that, as you point out, could have been a leading edge in the year 300, but it's no longer a leading edge now. So we, we're frozen at states, at stages. At states, unfortunately, we kind of do the same thing. We don't we, we allow a tepid second person, what a friend we have in Jesus. We don't allow a radical lover beloved relationship in second person. We certainly don't allow a first person before Abraham was I am to be stabilized in my case. Only one, one historical person can have that revelation. And we don't really do much about a third person you know, all, all of this arising as Lila, spirit arising as Lila, and we'd better care for it. You know, we better embrace it. So in terms of states and stages, we can, we can, be, we can be tepid in Christianity. And in terms of shadow as well, you know, we just, we just sort of ignore it. And the fact that we've limited the, the first and second, you know, the, the states and stages means that, that the shadow's got un unlimited room to grow. You know, it's got all the pesos can go into shadow and they, they, they tend to do so, you know, with this denial of the body and denial of life and denial of reality. So, so again, Layman, you spoke really, really eloquently of any future spirituality, the future of the religion of tomorrow, you know, the, this, this awesome book, it has to be of the earth. It has to be ecological. It has to be, of the body, it has to honor it. it, has to, it has to be dust to divinity, you know, and we can't get so caught up in thinking about the heaven that is to come that we totally neglect the earth that is right now. Cynthia Borgoas has written really beautifully recently. Uh, and after Rabbi Heschel, Abraham Joshua Heschel, Love is made for the human heart. Heaven and earth meet right here, right now. It's not a future thing, and it's not another realm. It's those realms meet right now, right here. And our mistake has been to identify with the earth part of that equation, to put the heaven in the future and as somewhere totally else. And then, you know, let debase the earth and let it become what it's, what it's becoming. So... Uh, we have to use these very elements and, and, you know, we have to, Terre de Chardin has an amazing mass of the universe piece of writing where he, he performs the mass, but he performs it with a cosmos. It's fantastic. Jesus did it with everything on the table that happened to be there for his last supper, but we have to do that for everything. So we have to consecrate 
the earth now realize its holiness. And we have to repeat the miracle of the transubstantiation. Not that happened one time in the last of supper, the last supper in Palestine, but with the earth right now. And then we've got to take what the implications are in the showing up and we've got to do them and we've got to do them fearlessly. And we've got to band together as you're doing in, in these podcasts and decide what we need to do, discern what we need to do, use these, you know, what I would say, the mind of Christ in your case, you, you, you're, <laughs> you're both clearly onto it in the, the way that you've spoken, you, you're putting on that mind, that's what I see, and, and I honor it. So we've got to take that, but then we've got to show up and draw the line in the sand and turn the tables, because there are a lot of lines in the sand that need to be drawn right now. And there's a lot of tables that need to be turned. And if you ask, what would Jesus do? That's what Jesus would do. And if you ask, what will Christ do? Well, that's up to us. I wanted to follow up with a, just one question about practice and in working on this book and, and going deep into the many layers and, and, and branches of this vine as, as you have, have you felt for yourself any intuitions of, of new practices um, growing out of that um, that might take the form of, of classes or, or retreats or just your own personal practice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel, you know, resonances with some of what I read in your book of with you know my own experiments in developing maybe a Christian Tantra you know as you note there's you can easily find a similarity between what Christ did on the cross and something like uh, Tibetan Tonglen or you know the Last Supper and the transubstantiation of the body and the gift of the body to all with the Tibetan practice of Chut where you, you make your, your body into food for all beings. And, mm -hmm. you know, so just curious if you've thought of and, and, and worked on any practices growing out of, of what you're exploring in the book. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and that's, that's one of the most exciting aspects, I would say. So I, I wrote about, a, you know, what was a revelation for me? There were a couple of them as, as I really started to, to learn and practice Buddhism. In, in my early days of integral and, and seeing that there's absolutely no contradiction at all to, to practice in the East and practice in the West. And my intention, you know, is, is to remain ca canonically in the West because the gifts that I've got to give can't be given as deeply if I, you know, eschew the whole tradition and say I'm out. You know, now I've lost relevance to, to 2 billion people who, who I might have some words for otherwise. So, so that said, you can practice deeply East and West. And just in the early days of Integral, I, I would notice things like, hmm, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb and it's empty. That's so interesting. You know, and I started putting a capital E on that emptiness. And she tells Peter and John and they run. and uh, I, I always love that the John outruns Peter. You know, Peter's the symbol of the church, right? <laughs> so John runs faster, gets there first, and he sees that it's empty. And then Peter sees that it's empty too. Well, that's, that's a capital E, empty. And um, you know, what's become kind of powerful for me, and this is in, in, in the footsteps of Eckhart, Meister Eckhart. When we, when we give ourselves in kenosis, God has no choice but to fulfill and fill that emptiness. No choice. It's actually forcing God's hand. Nature abhors a vacuum. And it's not that God abhors emptiness, but emptiness has to be filled. And emptiness has to be filled with whatever God has to, has to fill that emptiness with. And all, all spirit has to fill the emptiness with is spirit. So, but spirit is humanity. If I, if I have an, a human openness and emptiness, then spirit has to fill that with the spirit as humanity in me. So when, when, when Jesus died, the, the scriptures were so badly unfulfilled and the temple was so badly broken and the promise was so badly not kept that God had no choice but to, to lift this beautiful being who lay in Savasana, 
in the tomb. God had no choice. So the humanity of Jesus forced the divinity of Christ to, to animate and lift that body. And, you know, that miracle is to be repeated in all our case. And it, it's the extent of our kenosis, the extent of our emptying that God fills. Uh, Karl Rahner, humanity is the mystery of infinite emptiness. God is the mystery of infinite fullness. So you know what happens when you empty, you're filled. And, you know, Jesus emptied himself of his humanity, but he also emptied himself of his divinity. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself. And, and so to be filled. So that so that tomb was so empty and love was such a refugee. Love was so homeless that love remained with him in the tomb. And three days later, you know, love lifted him and love will lift us. So there's an incredible opportunity for new practices. You know, I, I, um, I read uh, Maharaj and Ramana Maharshi and uh, in the fall and, and the, the practice of I amness is so profound, so profound. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that's what Jesus practiced in the desert. And that became a, a, an amazing practice for me, just that self inquiry, you know, and, and really coming deeply into I am. And, and so I, I see it really clearly which is that we have a body, that body is animated by a mind, and we tend to identify with those. You know, we, we have an exclusive identification with our body-mind, and, and there's immense suffering there. So what, what Jesus did was abided in the consciousness, the pixel of consciousness, that, that, that local opening of consciousness in which he had a mind which had a body, and the mind he had was the mind of Christ, and the body he had was the sacred heart of Christ. And he practiced his stages in the mind of Christ and his states in the body of Christ from his Christ consciousness, and then he abided in awareness. So it's just stepping back, body, mind, Christ consciousness, God consciousness. And he did that in the desert. And then he abided in awareness for the rest of his life. For the, the three years coming out, he abided in awareness. But then just flashed forth consciousness, mind, body, bam, line in the sand. Consciousness, mind, body, turning the tables. And just repeated that. Rest, rest as I am who am. Be still and know that I am God. And then just animated across that soul, mind, body, and acted in the world in, in love to make the new earth conform perfectly to the kingdom of heaven, which he'd realized. So that's an Eastern practice that fits spectacularly perfectly in the West. Tonglen, you know, at, at snow mass, just, just listening for the first time, hearing, and Jesus breathed his last. And it's like, oh my God, he was in Tonglen on the cross, breathing in the suffering, breathing out compassion until one great last breath in of all suffering for all of time and one great last breath out that we're still feeling right now on this call. So yeah, the, the practices are amazing. Once we have those lanterns of the East and, and you're, you're exactly right, Bruce, we can, we can start to, to make them up. You know, uh, I sit in Lexio Divina with the words of Ken. It's fantastic. It doesn't have to be the words of the Bible. It could easily be the words of Thomas or the words of somebody who's beautifully seen with new eyes, something that subsisted when those scriptures were written but didn't exist, but now exist now. So the, the practices open up spectacularly and, and the Christian Tantra for one is, is just amazing. Christianity should be the height of second person practice, you know, not a tepid one. And then the, the, the humility of the kenosis of the second person opens up an amazing I am first person and an amazing spirit dancing as Leela third person. So it, it's all there in Christianity. We just haven't taken it up with 
with a tepid second person and none of the first or third really in, in the canonical history of Christianity, but there's no reason why not. I have a very panoptic relationship to interpretations of the gospel, right? If it's pretty much biography, fine. If it's just metaphor, fine. If Christ was really a piece of Roman propaganda or an emissary from a hidden occult lodge or a recreation of a story of something that happened in ancient Egypt, I'm okay with all of those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my curiosity about you is like, if, if there was, if they came forward tomorrow and said hundred percent scientific proof, Jesus never lived historically. Does that in any way undermine what you're talking about? Yeah, not remotely. Not remotely. Um, so, so here's the reason. We have a story of wake up, grow up, clean up, show up in Jesus of Nazareth. That story has taken effect in my life because I'm choosing to wake up, grow up, clean up, show up in my case, Christ in my case. So, you know, whether the story is the Genesis allegory, you know, and they find the bones, that story has caught life in me and it's alive in me and I feel Christ in me. The, I realize that Jesus, the name is an injunction. It's not just the name of a good, of a good guy, you know? Uh, so his, his name more accurately translated is Joshua. The first letters are the God of Israel you know, the, the name that, that, that we don't speak. But that's the first half of his name, YHWH. The second half of his name is saves or rescues. So you'll watch a football game, you'll see a placard up at the field goal, Jesus saves. Well, it's an injunction. It's an injunction. And what it means is I am who am rescues. And so we just need to from our body mind, which are amazing vehicles of embodied love in the world, just abide in, in the consciousness that holds them in the I am who am. And then abide in the, the awareness which holds that consciousness. That's, that's the path. That's the way. Jesus says, I am the way. Well, that's the way. That's the way that he took. And that's the way that he he gave us an injunction to take as well. Do what I've done in your case, but do greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. So if it was a story, it doesn't matter because Christ is alive in me. And that's that's my proof of the resurrection, you know, is that uh, let's say he existed and he lived and he died. Well, whatever happened is that this group of apostles around him who had been scattered all came back and said, <laughs> Peter says, don't crucify me upright because I'm not worthy to die as my Lord did. So if you're going to crucify, crucify me upside down. So Peter took the courage. Something happened to him that he was honored to die for Christ, but he couldn't take the honor of dying exactly as Christ had done. So Christ was alive in that early Christian community. They were on fire. They were being hunted down and killed and tortured, uh, but they were absolutely on fire in the desert. So. So Christ lived again in them and Christ has lived through the centuries. And, you know, frankly, I'm not, I'm not angry at the institution because if your, if your revelations are worth anything, you better write them down because otherwise they're going to die with you. So that's what the church did, wrote it down. And I have the, the grace to read that story. So I'm really grateful that it was written down, but now, you know, I've got to live it in my case and it's taken such a, a deep root that it really doesn't matter to me, you know, what was what he actually said and what the words were put in his mouth later on. Because if words were put in his mouth later on, and most of the Gospel of John was put in his mouth, those words were put in his mouth later on. Well, that happened through the Spirit of Christ coming through the the, the evangelist John. And John said, We are sons and daughters of God. We do know not what we will be, but we do know that we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. That's an amazing statement. We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. 
So that's what's happened, no matter what the, the actual history, you know, that the spirit is really alive in this tradition through 20 centuries. And, uh, you know, it's knocking on the door again to, to do something, but the, the something now has to be of the earth and has to honor the body. It has to be tantric, you know, and has to lift all beings. Our ethic can't fall short of all beings. We have to act with the greatest depth for the greatest span, but that span has to be all beings, all sentient beings. And, you know, and then find the ways in our lives to have the maximal impact. Having a podcast, what would Jesus do? <laughs> he'd, have, he'd have a podcast. What will Christ do? Christ has a podcast, you know, and, and in my case, Christ is working in alternative energy and Christ is working on a new internet. You know, th those are the things that, that Christ will do uh, because we're deciding to take up the injunction. And if we put it in those words, fine or not, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I have faith, layman, and it's, it's I, I, I have faith in it, uh, and that faith is why the technical details of the story don't matter to me. Um, it's very, very different than belief. I've got a couple more questions, but I see you're unmuted there, Bruce. I had a comment I want to just throw in before your question. That's it. Just noticing that, uh, you know, if you are living a promissory faith where the main thing is you're told a story that historically this happened and in the future that will happen and you're just living in that hiatus period waiting for that to happen, then it might mean a lot to you if the story is proven to be untrue. Whereas if your life is injunctive, if you are centered around embodying and digesting and reproducing the story, it doesn't matter. You know, they can pull that historical factuality away and you've already got the living proof of the injunctive power. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, the, the, the story here is Christ. And there's a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who looked all the way up upon a God who was looking all the way down. And he recognized his Christhood. And he embodied his Christhood, and he did so perfectly. And that's why we're still talking about him. Um, and he just asked us to do the same thing, to, to embody our own Christhood. And so, yeah, Christ is the, is the story. And, you know, as I see it, there's God the Father. And there's Godhead before that, as Meister Eckhart beautifully said. and. Godhead becomes God the Father, God consciousness, and on the waves of the Spirit, breathes out Christ consciousness. And Christ consciousness exists in all beings and existed beautifully, subsists in all beings, is really well said, actually, existed in Jesus of Nazareth because he looked all the way up and in the desert found his Christhood and went from knowing the Torah, loving the temple, believing the promise, to fulfilling the Torah, becoming the temple, and fulfilling the promise. So he did that and just said, do the same as I've done in, in your case. So it, it's a totally injunction. And this faith is a transformative faith. It, the whole purpose is metanoia. The whole purpose is put on the mind of Christ. Go beyond your mind, put on the mind of Christ and uh, dare to do it in, in your case. And that's what, what the saints have done. Um, and that's what, what we have to do, you know, and uh, we're being baptized by fire. So it's choiceless. It's, it's very beautiful to conceive spirit as uh, almost an artistic process over long evolutionary time. And it does free us from being too concerned about the historical details because if you're standing in front of the statue of david it's pretty weird to turn to the person beside you and go you know that used to just be stone you know like nobody cares that's not what this is about <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah yeah it's a it's a masterpiece it's a non-dual masterpiece yeah i it's something that came up for me which was a, a thought that my whole life i've been reading books where people were almost eager 
to let me know that the word translated as repent actually means changing your mind or changing yes. your consciousness mm -hmm. and annoia. <laughs> and there's a lot of great stuff about that realization, but I wonder if something is lost by in contemporary society, by kind of insulating us from remorse, from repentance, from the recognition of sin, from some of those harder elements of traditional religion and traditional Christianity that, you know, in a, a new age psychoanalytic consumer society, we really don't want to have to experience any pain. But yeah. there was a real feeling that the purifying power of remorse and repentance was an essential part of the spiritual journey. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a Kyrie that has been incredibly powerful for me. It's from a uh, Palestrina. So uh, the, the, the beauty of it historically is that it, it begins in Gregorian chant, but then absolutely flowers out into the spectacular harmony. You know, so it's a very, very integral piece, very, you know, very ancient, but amazing. And it cuts you to the heart. And, and that's part of its power. And I think part of dealing with shadow is, is necessarily that repentance, you know, necessarily that sorrow for ways that we've hurt all beings, ways that we've hurt our own being, ways that because in shadow we've hurt other beings. So, you know, um, my own working with shadow, there were many, many, many tears uh, of, of sorrow at, you know, how from my rational, I had denied that shadow and pushed it down and repressed it. And then it, you know, obviously would, would find ways to, to come through just to try to get to the light that would end up hurting other people who I loved, who I would never hurt consciously, you know, but then ended up hurting unconsciously. So I, I think that's an absolutely crucial aspect of the church. And, and I, I do love that repent metanoia, you know, that's very empowering for me, but that said, um, we need to have deep, deep sorrow. It, it's well known that recently in Kamloops, there were 215 bodies of children, indigenous children found in a mass grave. So these children had disappeared. That was the story. And because things weren't, weren't being written down by those indigenous communities, there, there wasn't a historical record. There might've been a historical record with the state and the church, but, but those were covered up. And uh, so th these, these 215 bodies were found and, and you know, we need to be deeply sorrowful and we can't just say it's Canada's fault because what's Canada? I mean, Canada was, was a couple years old when that happened or, or 50 years old. You know, you can't just blame this, this, this nondescript Canada. We have to blame the government for the policy of residential schools. And we have to blame the church for what happened and, and how disease was allowed to spread and how abuse was rampant and how these people were not treated like human beings or even sentient beings. So the only, the only reaction is, is to weep by the church and by the government and not just say it's Canada's fault or, you know, to, ha to have less than a, than a complete responsibility on either of those two cases. So this is hugely important. Otherwise, it's just plain bypassing. And we do a heck of a lot of bypassing these days. So um, the, the church tradition is, is amazing. That's why I mentioned the Kyrie, you know, and... and just like Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fill it. We have to fulfill the tradition, not abolish it, but fulfill it. Take all the good in it. Let the cultural trappings go. You know, like Ken always says with sin, it's, it's, it's half profound wisdom, half militaristic bullshit. <laughs> it's hard to tease it apart, but we've got to do that in the case of the church and build a church for tomorrow, which is a pattern of the religion of tomorrow. Ken is beautifully articulated it for Buddhism with the fourth turning. We have to do the same with Christianity. And that's, you know, um, Paul Smith, you know, the Integral Christian Network. Uh, that's, that's the work now is to, is, to, is to build a church for tomorrow. 
um, along exactly the lines that you talked about and honoring things like repentance, that there's something real in repentance. But, you know, it's, it's that, that cross on the forehead, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Um, there's truth in it. And um, the, the issue is not to get solely identified with the dust. We're dust to divinity. And if we honor that entire spectrum, then we can create a new earth and a new church and a new religion. I have my last question before Layman gets to his here. David Michael Levin or David Michael Kleinberg Levin, um, he's written a number of really beautiful, mostly philosophical books, but with a contemplative dimension. But one of the things he talks about is a practice of tears or a yoga of tears. Um, he's got a book on meditating on vision and the different ways that the world manifests as light to us and how to transform that. And anyway, part of uh, his way of working with light, working with vision, working through nihilism is through a yoga of tears. So just a reference I wanted to throw in there, but also as a preface to asking you a number of places in the book you mentioned, you know, now through modern scholarship, we can see, and then you would explain something. I'm curious, who are the, the modern scholars or theologians who are most inspirational for you right now? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. And, and you mentioned the, the yoga of tears. I, there, there's, a medit there's a practice that, that I, I want to write about. So it just takes some, some beginning form in the book. But just like spirit, unqualified becomes Satchitananda in Vedanta. So it becomes being, knowledge, bliss. That's the first form of spirit from you know, unmanifest to manifest. I am is so important in the Gospel of John, in Christianity altogether, but in the Gospel of John, I am is so important. And John is amazingly symbolic. Uh, I've, I've got a great book here, actually, by Bruno Barnhart, um, which is The Good Wine. It's fantastic. And what it is, is it's a chiastic reading of John, meaning, let's say time isn't linear. So don't go from John 1 to the end of John. Let's look at how... The whole thing is woven around the bread of life discourse, John 6, and then see everything emanates out from this amazing bread of life discourse. So time is, is it's not quite cyclical or circular, but it's emanating from a central point. And that point is always right now, right? That's the power of now. It's the present. And everything radiates out from this chaotic present of now. And in John, it's John 6. Uh, bread of life discourse. So Jesus says, I am seven times in the gospel of John, seven times. He says something really profound about I am, I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the gate. I am the bread of life. Uh, I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. So he says those seven times and they line up spectacularly with the chakras, just spectacularly with the chakras. You know, I, I am the gate is the hara and the gate is love to the heart. Like it's just amazing. And that's the gateless gate. So Jesus from his identity goes through the gateless gate and looks back and now he's Christ and there never was a gate and that's Jesus Christ. And we're called to replicate that transubstantiation in our case. So th that's an amazing practice with the seven chakras and the I am statements of Jesus in the gospel of John. And it could be a Kundalini, you know, or it could be a, a descending. There's something amazing there. And I've just got the very outlines of it in the book, but, but that's a book, you know, and, so uh, alive for me right now, um, I mean, Father Thomas is so present. And uh, I had the opportunity to do a long 
long, like a hundred day retreat with him. And he would just give me these wild <laughs> readings. And I'd be reading till, till midnight and then up for 430 prayers. And it was, it was no problem at all because my consciousness was on fire and that meditation was taking the place of sleep and it didn't matter. So uh, I definitely love uh, Panikkar is, is really great. And he's saying, let's move from Christology, which is this applying of Greek forms onto this Semitic man who wouldn't have even been aware of the forms that we're now projecting onto him, uh, move from that to Christophany. And Christophany is quite beyond the church. And again, when I listen to you two speak, I hear Christ through you. you you're, you're putting on the mind of Christ and then speaking from there and acting from there. And that's what that guy did 2000 years ago to, to amazing effect and said, do greater things than these because I'm going to the father. So yeah, Panikkar, um, I, I, I with you love Merton. Um, and uh, I just, you know, like I say, I, I hit Ken at the edge of integral and uh, he was really liberating for me. So, uh, you know, I had the amazing privilege to, to, to read him. I never thought I would read something like that. Amazing privilege to meet him, to work with him, to be his friend. Uh, and he's definitely one of my dearest friends now. And what I realized is I've got to take this, this 800 page book and apply it. That's what we need to do is, is to take those awesome words and apply them in, in the fora, the forums that we see now. And, uh, there are many of them, you know, so that that's what it's come to me. But yeah, I, I would say coming down to Ken, uh, that's, that's my lineage is you know, the Merton, Keating, Panikkar, and, and now Ken, and now it's, let's apply that. Um, and that's the baptism by the spirit and by fire. Uh, the, the subtitle of sex ecology spirituality is the spirit of evolution. And that's an amazing phrase to me because that's Ken's injunction. Take the vantage point of the highest stage take the view of the highest state see what you see there but now you've become an aperture for spirit to evolve directly unadulterated you know there's no stepping down because you're 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 at the edge already and let that become the novel immersion of today which in a whiteheadian sense is prehended by tomorrow so take the Today, the new earth, as it is, as you say, Layman, in your, in your, you know, the world as it is, take it right now as it is, and let's just decide that the novel emergent is love. And keep applying that in every moment of our life, moment to moment to moment. Well, that would create an incredible harvest at the end of our, you know, our short lifetimes. Um, but that's what Jesus of Nazareth did was, was infuse the moment with love, with endless love in every moment. And that becomes a very big equation over a very short period of time. So yeah, that, that I would say is my, my lineage. Uh, I love Cynthia Borgo's stuff. It's really, really great. Um, and now we just got to write it down. What we're seeing on these podcasts, we just got to write it down and live it. Okay. Um, maybe I've got a final comment and a final question. Uh, my final comment is I always loved I am the way. And it reminds me of Taoism, of course. And there's um, different modes in which we can think of what a way is, right? Very often we think of a pathway, but there's also just the way that anything is. And I always loved thinking of how anything gets done and how anything is, thinking of the how, not the what of everything as mm -hmm. being a person. <laughs> Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. The, the, yeah, yeah. The love personification of the mm -hmm. way that anything gets done or is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that really, that's one of the ways I connect with Christianity. Um, yeah. Um, my question is, is we've talked a lot in a way about how uh, integral thinking can infuse and inform and structure and call forth a new kind of Christianity. Um, but what do you think Christianity has to add? to the integral community, to the integral movement? What can we gain from embracing mm -hmm. the Christian? Yeah, 
Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Layman. Um, and I do love that that way. It's just amazing, you know. And, and I love that there's the lover and the beloved and the loving, and the lover and the beloved just fall away in the loving, you know, in, in the how uh, and in the who. It's re it's really quite beautiful, and you, you kind of lose the the what. Um, and you know, it becomes this verb of wanting. Hildegard said that. Um, that's the practice of Christianity is wanting. That's what Jesus did. He, uh, uh, again, bread of life or, or the Last Supper discourse. You know that 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 all may be one, as I am one in you, and you are one in me. And uh, you know this amazing co-presencing and polyphilia that he's talking about in that discourse is just astounding. Uh, that all may be one. So he he. In the end, in retrospect, he achieved the second person and then became one with the first person, you know, so he went to Godhead. And uh, my contention is certainly that that this guy hit hit non-dual union, and the proof of that is the resurrection. And not everybody saw it, and that's perfect too, because you had to be in the state of consciousness, you had to meet his cosmic address to see him, otherwise you wouldn't see him. So the world that didn't see him can, can quite happily say, well, he never existed or he wasn't lifted, but you know, a, a, a critical mass of people were, and that critical mass is now one billion Catholics, two billion Christians, um, and I'd say it's much more for better than for worse. And so, what what Christianity brings to the world and to integral is part of what we said that that spirits return, and this guy with his Vajra brush, just painted love all over second and third tier, what would become second and third tier. It was just, just open space to him, but it's second and third tier now to us. And the reason there's love there is that Christ was there first um, in the person of Jesus and others who, who painted that. And so we're, we're distant from the alpha when the jump was made, and we're distant from that 2000 year old Jesus of Nazareth. But we're actually much nearer to the omega that's calling us. We're, 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 we're much closer. You know, we're maybe three fifths of the way there. Who knows? You know, if, if the world can come into its heart, then we're halfway there toward the omega. And, uh, you know, that, that, that last, the, the first jumping off, uh, the first little separation, I think the gap is love, you know, that the, there's spirit. And spirit desires to share spirit's abundance with somebody else. And so in the mind of spirit, there's suddenly another. And now there's there's a jumper who's who's on the jump. So that little that the alpha is love. That little jump was just spirit's desire to love and be loved. And the omega is also love that's pulling us back, surely pulling us back. The consciousness of God pulling the consciousness of Christ through the waves of spirit in all of us, in the person Jesus of Nazareth, for sure. But the Christ consciousness in all of us is, is coming toward the Omega, which is, which is the good news for sure. So I think what Christianity has to bring is love and love to the world and love to integral. Uh, our, our beloved Diane Hamilton says, the closest thing to love in Buddhism is a vague sense of warmth. So, <laughs> Um, it's perfect that, that love and that love engenders humility and engenders kenosis and engenders a complete emptying of self. And if Jesus did not deem equality with God, something to be grasped at, but rather emptied himself, then why would I not empty myself of my exclusive self-identification with my body mind? Why would I not empty myself of that and then be able to inhabit those two great vehicles of love? in the world. And that love is a gate of humility in second person, which then opens a really deep I amness and a really deep spirit is Lila dancing before us, but then we should honor the one we brought to the dance, you know, by loving her and, and loving the earth and being careful about what we extract and what we emit. And realizing that it's inexcusable that somebody should be hungry in this day and age, or that 215 children should be buried in a markless, nameless grave. So what Christianity can bring to integral is, is that love, that humility of the second person that then opens the first and third really beautifully. 
Um, so it, its gifts are remarkable. And um, we just haven't embodied them yet. And, you know, the book is called The Way of Embodied Love. What I do write is that I'm the last man on earth who should be writing this book because, you know, I've been such a seeker. And, and so in the absolute that I was blind to the fact that this Jesus of Nazareth is one of the most embodied beings in history. He had this high revelation and identification in the desert, but then he came down and he landed and he showed up, stabilized a high stage, a high state, brought light to his shadow, and then he just landed in a line in the sand and turning the tables fearlessly and ferociously. And uh, that's the embodiment and love is nothing if it's not embodied. So that's, that's our task. And that's why we've been given these bodies. Love was created for this realm. We were created for love and heaven and earth meet in this heart and, and your heart and your heart and all of our hearts. Uh, and nowhere else. Love was not created for heaven. <laughs> it was created for earth. So we, we need to embody it, you know, with these bodies, with these minds. And in, in my Christian understanding, with the sacred heart, which beats in us, and the mind of Christ, which crowns us. Uh, but then while we, while we have time, while we have this embodiment to let that love land in the world for the benefit and compassion of all beings. Well, I'm definitely feeling a little bit transfigured. Uh, it's been great to meet you, to be with you, to love you. And I appreciate all the work you've been putting into this role. And uh, I don't know if Bruce has any final thing he'd like to add. Love is ferocious. In the end, it will consume us all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, this has been a beautiful talk. And I really want to congratulate you on, on the book. I think it's a, it's a wonderful offering and uh, really wonderful to connect with you in this way. And I look forward to a lot more exchanges. I, I am so honored, gentlemen. I, I honor your offering. It's majestic. And uh, it's, it's Christ in your case, as I see it. And it, it's, it's moving the world, which, which um, needs our moving, you know, uh, Awareness awakened in, in Christ and God willing is awakening in us to awaken awareness slumbering in all beings. So, you know, may it be so, and we definitely have a lot to talk about. So, so this, <laughs> this is the first of hours, the first two hours of many hours of, of uh, both discussions, but also collaborations, uh, which I see on all sorts of friends. Let's do it. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. I bow deeply to the divine in you. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.